The conversation tonight with Bettina Herlin and Gino Segre on this fabulous book is going to be moderated and in conversation with Dr. Larry Gladney. I don't know how many of you know him, but he himself, he has so many syllables in the things he does, I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce it. He's professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's dean uh, for the natural sciences. But he also, what he thinks about and cares about in addition to all this stratospheric stuff is kids. And so he has worked hard for middle schoolers and young people to get engaged in the sciences, and that itself is laudable. So here to introduce our dynamic duo of Herlin and Segre is the wonderful Dr. Larry Gladney. Thank you. It's my uh, privilege to be able to introduce the two authors of this fabulous book. Gino Segre is Emeritus Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Pennsylvania. He's been a visiting professor at MIT and Oxford University. I'm proud to say that he was my chair uh, at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Penn and the former director of theoretical physics at the National Science Foundation. Gino is the author of three books of scientific history, uh, particularly on atomic physics. And his, first, his, uh, his second book, uh, Faust in Copenhagen, was a finalist in the Los Angeles Times Book Fair and the winner of the American Institute of Physics Science Writing Award. Bettina Horlin is a former Philadelphia Health Commissioner. She taught healthcare disparities at the University of Pennsylvania for 16 years and has also been a visiting lecturer at Haverford College and Oxford University. She is the daughter of Los Alamos physicist Herman Horlin and chronicled her parents' meeting and departure from Nazi Germany in her own fabulous book, which I do recommend you read, Steps of Courage, My Parents' Journey from Nazi Germany to America. She grew up in Atomic City in Los Alamos, and she and Gino are a husband and wife team in all ways. They have seven children and nine grandchildren between them. I'm very proud to call them my friends, so please join me in welcoming Gino and Bettina. So I'm going to start off with uh, something that's a little unusual perhaps, but I want to thank the two authors here. Uh, I believe maybe about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, Gino uh, on the uh, death of another famous physicist, uh, Richard Feynman, said that the, the greatest thing you could say about him is that you are so proud to be holding the same union card as somebody uh, <laughs> who also held it, who was named Richard Feynman. And I, I really feel very, uh, very lucky to have been asked to, to interview the two of them about this book because Fermi is the physicist. physicist. Uh, he may not be so well known to the general public, but he is in fact um, one of the great heroes of anybody who's done atomic and subatomic physics. And it's just so amazing to have this fabulous and authoritative uh, story of his life. It's not only me who said that. Um, we have a review from the Wall Street Journal, which has also just come out which uh, says exactly that. So this is a fabulous book, and I want to get started by asking the two of them to tell us what their motivation was for writing a book about Fermi, who's not as well known as, say, Einstein or, or Feynman. Well, maybe I'll, um, st am I too loud here? No. no? Okay. So maybe I'll start out. Um, I was born in Italy, came to the United States as a baby, but then went back to Italy, and Fermi was, um, a hero in Italy, and um, and if you wanted to be a physicist, he was a double hero. And um, as Larry said, he's the physicist physicist. So um, I thought, gee, I've written a few books, but there's no big book on Fermi, and um, it'd be great to write one. But as I started to write it, and uh, Bettina has been my first reader and helper on all the other books. They're all dedicated to her. Um, she saw that I was in a little bit of distress because I was in awe of the, of the man. And I thought, at a certain point, um, what am I going to do? And I was losing sight of, um, as I said, so stunned by the physics, I was losing sight of the great political and social um, 
times that he lived in and all the adventures. And uh, Bettina sort of said, said to me, you know, this book may need a little restructuring or a lot of restructuring. <laughs> And maybe we can go a little easy on the quantum mechanics. And I was holding back. <laughs> <laughs> and so it became um, quite a different book. Um, and it truly became our book. And it's been a really wonderful experience. And I think some compliments to Bettina, not only for what she did, but she did learn finally a lot of physics. It was about <laughs> Time, you know. <laughs> Her father was a physicist, but he couldn't do it. And I couldn't do it, but the book did it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a risk here, Bettina, and say there might have been a little bit of challenge in co-authoring this book with Gino. Oh no, <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> it was just a bed of roses. Um, <laughs> it was it was very challenging, but in wonderful ways because it was a conversation that was on a level that it's not that we don't talk about intellectual things, but it, it was a whole other level. And it was arguments, good arguments, between the two of us. Most uh, of the time. <laughs> most of the time. Uh, and it was a, a time that was very tough for me to learn the physics. Uh, as Gino said, my father had tried to teach me physics. Uh, I went, I studied physics, Larry, you probably don't know this, I took a course at the University of Colorado, my alma mater, um, with George Gamow, who, famous physicist, and he knew that I was a daughter of a physicist, and he asked me to come up and demonstrate answers on the board for everybody else. <laughs> you know, if anything freezes you, that will. So, uh, but there was a tremendous give and take in terms of the way we thought about the book, conceptualized the book. Uh, and there were different times that Gino's Italian personality would come out and my German one would come out. <laughs> no, 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 so, no. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think it was a very healthy interaction and an exciting one. So how did the title come about, The Pope of Physics? Seems like a very strange way to describe someone. Well, you have to remember that uh, this was Rome. And for Rome, it isn't, uh, there was a little bit of a joke there because, you know, Fermi was a physicist, physicist, and he was infallible. People used to joke. His answers were always right. He knew everything. And of course, the Pope was regarded as being infallible. So um, the people in Rome, they all had got nicknames. They were a young bunch of physicists all in their 20s when they started out. So one was the Pope, another one was the Cardinal, another one was the Grand Inquisitor, <laughs> and so on. Um, but there's no question about who was the Pope. And he was the pope in Rome. Of course, there was another pope there, but that's another matter. And I think the group in general were probably a rather godless group. And it was, there was a certain amount of irreverence uh, to this. Uh, I am amused if one looks at Amazon.com and looks for our book, that you will see it's the number one bestseller of Catholic books. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people might be surprised, but anyway, <laughs> they're buying the books. <laughs> I, I think I might add at this time when he was nicknamed the Pope, the Pope, after the Italians had, quote, conquered Rome uh, and taken away the Pope's temporal domain, he retreated to the Vatican, so he did not recognize Italy. There were no diplomatic relations between uh, Rome, well, between the Italian Republic and the Vatican, that didn't change until 1929 when Mussolini made an agreement. So for a while, he really could be the only pope in Italy. <laughs> Amazing. So set the stage for us a little bit. Um, Fermi is this young man. He's completely unknown, even in his own country. Within a decade, he's going to become this, this international star of science. But it's during a time when fascism is, is in reign, full reign uh, in the 1920s. 
How does that affect a young Fermi? What, 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 what role does that play in his, his development? Um, well, you know, there he is in his 20s. He comes from a very modest family. His parents had not gone to college. There was nobody else in Italy in physics at the time. He was the leader. And he was just purely thinking about physics, as far as I can tell. The only, um, he joined the fascist party, but that's because Mussolini appointed him to the Royal Academy, which doubled his salary. And he said, hey, doubling my salary is a good thing. And, okay, so I'll pledge allegiance to Mussolini. It doesn't bother me one way or another, as long as I can do my experiments. You know? Yeah, I think he was uh, amazingly apolitical, and this was a hard aspect of uh, him for us to in in to accept. Um, both of our parents, respectively, fled fled from um, in the case of Gino Italy and fascism. In the case of my parents, Nazi Germany, and and that somebody could be totally apolitical is sort of against my grain. But that is what he was. Uh, he, he, he lived for physics. Physics was his religion. Getting back to the Pope analogy, I, I think he, it was his calling. And he joined the fascist party. He thought it was a little ridiculous when he was made uh, a fellow in the Royal Academy of Italy. He had to wear a uniform with a fancy hat. He, he was not into any pomp and circumstance at all. Um, his mentor in Italy was a physicist who was a state senator. Um, the um, mayor of Rome at that time was a physicist. So it's not like he didn't have any role models there for that mix of science and phys uh, for science and politics. But he chose basically to keep his head low and um, maybe he hoped it would go away. He uses a wonderful term at, at some point when things get later on, when things get really uh, more, more tense. And he talked about, he and a colleague of his talked about physics as soma. And this was a term from Huxley, uh, Brave New World. And Soma was a mythical drug that you could take to reduce stress and not have to pay attention to things around you. So I think that he well knew that he was not paying attention to things around him. Uh, he was on Soma. I might add, though, that he came to the United States in the summers of 1930 for the first time, and back in 33, 34, 35, he came and he came to like, he liked the United States immediately, and he came to like it more and more. And I think if it hadn't been for his wife, who was very attached to Italy and to her family there, I think he would have left Italy. So he, he certainly wasn't political, but he didn't like fascism, and he didn't particularly like the Italian way of life at the time. So, so let's explore that a little bit, because uh, in the beginning of the book, you actually dedicate the book to immigrants. And um, yeah. you, you make a point of saying in the book that, of course, when he came and the war started, he was considered an enemy alien. Um, and yet he works on the most important project for the US uh, of, of the whole war effort. So how does he become so attached, and, and does he view himself as an immigrant or someone who maybe was born in the wrong place and, and wound up in the right place in 1938? You want to? Well, sure, I can. Um, I, I, should, I should also mention, you know, I'm, 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 I think you're trying to do this chronologically, which makes all sorts of sense, but we should mention that Fermi did marry a woman who was Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so when things started tightening up in, in Italy, and it became clearer and clearer that the racist laws were being imposed, I think there was a growing awareness. And I think that awareness really increased by the fact that he took a number of trips to the United States in the summer. The first time he came to the United States was in 1930, and he came with Laura, his wife, 
and they went to Michigan. And he fell in love. He fell in love with the United States. Um, what's, what was that wonderful ter term? Oh, that, but I'm jumping ahead. But he, he really came almost every summer after that to the United States. He loved the freedom of it. Uh, it was a very different kind of system in the United States. It wasn't the hierarchical kind of European hair professor system. It was very different. And he appreciated that. He appreciated the kind of equalization, the teamwork, um, and love the American culture. What, what I was trying to get at was, uh, where I jumped ahead, was uh, at one point um, when he decides that he is going to stay, stay here, uh, he tries to convince Heisenberg to, to come from Germany and stay in the United States. And his quote there, Gino, you do it better than I. Well, he said to, uh, this is in the summer of 1939, he had already emigrated to the United States, and he said, Heisenberg, you know, in Italy I was a big shot, but here I'm just a physicist like all the other guys around here. And it's so much better than being a big shot. Why don't you stay here? And Heisenberg said, basically, my country needs me. My country will need me in the future. I am a loyal German. And Fermi said, okay, I'm a physicist. And uh, he, he stayed, he was a fairly, he didn't dress fancy, he didn't have a fancy, he's not, um, even, this is a little bit of a sin for an Italian, he even added water to his wine when he drank it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. So, so let's talk a little bit about his science. So I'm, I'm gonna, going to ask both of you to answer sort of independently because we have one person steeped budding in science scientist. Yes, and one budding scientist. So what would you say was his greatest achievement in science? And you can, you can have two different perspectives on that, obviously, because of uh, well, pure I physics or, or his impact for what he did for the war effort. Um, well, you know, I started by saying I was in awe and uh, he was the only physicist, and I think Larry will agree with me on this, the only physicist in the 20th century to have achieved both the very top of the profession as both a theorist and an experimentalist. Not true of, you know, Einstein, Bohr, Schrodinger, Feynman. And also he's the last physicist who basically worked in all fields of physics. So I would say I, I could pick probably if I had to, three or four things in physics that I would single out. Uh, one to 25, Fermi statistics, the basis for all our you know, conductors and semiconductors and transistors, the way we think about electricity and metals. Um, the introduction, there were two forces in nature, gravity and electromagnetism. He introduced the third one in a theory that most of us work on, you know, uh, daily. And um, he was also the, the first man to use neutrons to bombard nuclei, and that's the basis of nuclear physics and the basis of how uh, a fusion and how the bomb was built, but also how reactors are built of nuclear medicine. So he did a lot. Well. <laughs> I, I, and I my physicist associate here will name <laughs> three more now. <laughs> well, contributions and is, is probably not quite the word to use, but I would say that Fermi has to be remembered for being the person, more than any single person, who was responsible, how you feel about it is another thing, but who was responsible for the making of the atom bomb. Uh, it changed our world. It changed the way we think about the world. It changed na nations. It changed international relations. It opened up a whole new era. Um, and that has to be a standalone in some, <coughs> in some kind of way, I think. So as controversial as it is, and maybe we'll get into, into that more with the questions, um, I, I would say that his research first and his experiment first and 
at the University of Chicago underneath the football stadium uh, where he has the first successful experiment in controlling nuclear fission, uh, a chain reaction, uh, which inevitably led to the making of the bomb. Uh, that has to go up very high on my list. And he was also a great teacher. I mean, depending on how you count the numbers, six or eight or 10 of his students got Nobel Prizes, but he set the style both in Italy um, and for people from Northern Europe in the 30s who came to study and work with him, and in post-war America, when the people who trained the likes of the peons here on the stage uh, were trained. So, um, so we're a huge all impact, in, yeah. Huh? A huge impact, just in terms of the people he touched and who they touched after him. Yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about the, the beginning of the atomic age, 1942. I, I think mm -hmm. when you make the movie, that's going to be one of the most exciting, exciting scenes, is, is putting that atomic pile together. Um, I also have to say the most unbelievable part of it is that the University of Chicago ever had a football team, but we'll come back to that. Um, so... It was a defunct stadium, as I recall. <laughs> which you could put an atomic pile into, obviously, not a very, very active team. So, so play, the, play out the scene for here. How, how does he put together the team, and, and is it unique that Fermi was the person who could actually have done this to create the first self-sustaining chain reaction that, of course, as Bettina points out, is the thing that makes it possible to build an atomic weapon? All right. Well, um, the pile is... is, is a he called, you coined the term pile. It's a bunch of bricks of lead with little balls of uranium in there, which uh, with some control rods, and when you pull out the control rods, he said, you'll have a chain reaction. Um, originally, it was going to be built in the Argonne Forest, but they ran into trouble with some of the construction workers. So Fermi went to the head of the project, and he says, no problem. There's a squash court there. We'll just, you know, me and the guys, we'll just put all the bricks in, you know. It's not a problem. It's 45,000 30-pound lead bricks or something. <laughs> um, we'll have two shifts of 12 hours, and we can do this in 15 days. Uh, and by the way, he said to the head of the project, to Arthur Compton, um, you better not tell the president of the university that we're doing this, <laughs> right? Can you imagine that happening today? <laughs> he, and in all fairness, uh, <laughs> Hutchins had approved the project, right? Uh, but well, he the didn't, project, but, he but didn't, not the experiment. Not the experiment. On he, campus. <laughs> he didn't know that it might blow the campus up. Right. <laughs> So, so how dangerous was this experiment? I mean, in the end, it puts out about a, a half a watt, right? Not a, not a whole lot. But at some really amazing point in the story, Fermi says, let's stop for lunch. <laughs> and they leave the atomic pile there uh, unguarded, and, and they go off for lunch for an hour and a half, and they come back, and it's right where it's supposed to be. Well, I think they did put a little, they put a lock on the door, I yeah. think. You know? <laughs> <laughs> But one of the things we were talking about before lunch, um, and Larry and I are both physicists, and Bettina's a, we'll get there yet, you know. <laughs> but um, he seemed to have always this perfect confidence that things were going to work the way he built them. Uh, and he had this already as a, as a kid. You know, there was no, no, he had no teachers, his parents didn't. He says, I know how to do things. I'll make it work. And um, was it dangerous? Probably not. Not with Fermi there, because everybody trusted, there's Fermi. He's done the calculations. Um, he told them, you know, the day before, OK, when you put these last bricks in, the 57th layer of bricks, then it will go critical when you pull out the last of the control rods. And that's exactly the way it went. I must say that, that the story 
of how that happened under, underneath Stagfield uh, was a remarkable story. When we went to the archives at the University of Chicago, um, where we're both, you know, they bring in boxes and you sit in a room that has glass uh, on two sides and uh, they make you wear gloves all of this, none of that happened in Italy when we, when we went to Italian archives, no gloves, you could handle whatever you wanted. But Have in, a little uh, coffee while you're studying. <laughs> <laughs> but at the University of Chicago, they're very careful about it, and understandably so. But I, I'm reading this account of what happened there underneath Stag Field when nuclear fission was successfully found and or controlled. And um, it was such a, I, I was totally thrown by this uh, unexpectedly emotional moment to read this because you know the world is gonna change. Um, and I start crying. I just start bursting out into tears and Gino's sort of looking at me and then one of the archivists come rushing in, comes rushing in with a box of Kleenex for me. <laughs> and she said, excuse me, could you just be careful not to drip on the... <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, a, it's an amazing story, and it's one of my favorite parts of the book because you have this room full of 50 people who base, basically have faith in Fermi. Uh, they are saying, we are going to be okay. They could have been blown to smithereens, as could have the campus, as could have the city. And they are there, and there is... Incidentally, one woman um, who is the only woman in the room, and she's the youngest person in the room. I think she was 26 at that point, Leona Marshall. And she is doing the neutron count. She is, it's her voice. It's the female voice. I, I've always thought this would make a great opera. I don't know if anybody's a composer here. But anyway, and, and the neutron count keeps on accelerating, you know, so she starts out and... It's 10, 20, 20 100,000. And I was always thinking that it would be a, a great aria, you know, 10, 20, 30, you know, and got up to the high C, which is that the pile has gone critical. Um, so it, it was uh, uh, quite a suspenseful time, but people had faith that Fermi knew what he was doing. He was Mr. Cool about it. He was totally, this is just another experiment. Yeah, I think just to add to that, that um, when you pull out the last control rod and the pile goes critical, it generated only half a watt, but it's increasing and it's increasing exponentially. So they're all waiting for Fermi to give the order to put the rod back in. <laughs> and. Um, he kept wanting to check that the curve really was exponential. So he, he, it took him slightly less than four minutes to give the order to put the rod in. And the people who were there, those four minutes, you know, they kept saying, when is he going to give the order to put the rod back in? And they didn't say anything because it was Fermi. But if it had been anybody else, I think they might have been yelling at him, put the rod back in. So this has now occurred. Um, Fermi joins three labs, all dedicated to, to the Manhattan Project. And this is all, as you say, science for him. Then the bomb goes off in July, and you know it works. Now it's no longer science. You have to make a decision as to whether to drop this or not. How does Fermi feel at this point? Is he still thinking of it as just science? Or does he know thousands of people are going to die because we've now made this thing and it actually is going to work the way we, we plan for it to work? Hmm. Well, I think I'll start. Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> It, it's difficult to know exactly how he felt. Uh, he, he felt, in terms of science, he felt that um, ignorance is the worst possible condition you can have, and, uh, and, and anything is, uh, you know, that, that knowledge is something inevitable, and that if we don't reach that knowledge, somebody else will. 
uh, that the laws of nature will be revealed, we will uncover them, and as a physicist, that he felt this was what his role was, this is what his calling was. So the bomb uh, gets developed, it goes off successfully at Trinity, as, as Larry just said, um, and then the decision has to be reached, what does one do with it? But actually, even before that bomb went off in July, in May, there are people in Washington, who at that point had some foresight, uh, said, we're going to have to decide what to do with this. It looks like we're going to actually make a bomb, and we're going to have to decide to do what to do with it. So what do they do? They do what everybody does. You appoint a committee. Uh, and this was called the interim committee uh, because it was just going to be about the bomb. Um, and with that interim committee, which was a distinguished committee of people, they had a scientific panel of four scientists who would advise the interim committee. The interim committee would advise the president. That was the sequence. Uh, on the interim committee was Oppenheimer, of course, and Fermi was on that, along with two other Nobel Prize physicists. And they were asked to make a recommendation. And they um, met in Los Alamos on June 15th and 16th, I believe, and there was tremendous controversy about what should be done. Should there be a demonstration? There was a whole group of physicists who felt there should be a demonstration in some remote island, some remote place. And that, that demonstration, we could invite Japan, we could invite maybe some other countries to that demonstration. They would see the power of this weapon and they would, it would prevent further war. The other camp was, uh, that's not going to work. The logistics are horrendous for one thing. And we need to drop it to show to the Japanese in particular, the Germans had already surrendered, uh, the Japanese that, that we have a weapon of mass destruction. And that, that was the controversy. And this committee, this panel, this scientific panel of four scientists looked at it and they made the recommendation that there was no um, viable alternative other than to drop the bomb on a major city and a major industrial center. Fermi was part of that. Uh, Fermi looked very much at the technical parts of it, but he was part of that decision making. Um, at the same time, when they made that recommendation, they said that they had no, in making that recommendation, that they had no special competence uh, to make the judgment, the political judgment, to drop a bomb. They, they were very modest in that regard, saying, we're not sure scientists are the best people to make these decisions. Uh, but that was the decision that was made. And we looked very hard. There was no, nothing that we could find in our research that ha ha had any evidence that Fermi was hesitant in making that decision. So. Don't forget, the scientists who were in Los Alamos had, by and large, fled fascism, and they were very patriotic about this country. Yeah, it's obviously a, a very controversial decision. Many thought that this weapon was so horrible that it might bring an end to all wars. That was a view um, that Niels Bohr discussed with them in Los Alamos, um, and uh, there are physicists who differed. There was a, a group at Chicago, uh, a committee headed by a eminent physicist named James Frank, that made a recommendation that it not be used uh, as a war weapon. Uh, obviously, a very tricky one, and clearly, you know, the president of the United States. You have to remember, this is a war. And um, are you going to not use it because of um, the danger of bringing into the world such a weapon? Uh, are you going to then tell the parents of men and women 
of United States men and women who are killed in a war that goes on that might have been stopped. Men then, pretty much men. Pretty much yeah. Men. Yeah. That you did not use a weapon because of moral scruples. You know, that's a decision. Um, very tough one, yeah. Very hard Well, one. And, and don't forget the United States had invested $2 billion in the Manhattan Project at that point. And $2 billion, and what, what are we going to show for it? A, a, a weapon that we're not going to use. Uh, that's, a, that's a hard thing for politicians to justify. And people were also concerned that if it wasn't used, that future scientific funding would be in jeopardy. Yeah, but I think that wasn't the primary, you know, that's, these it was are in all there. secondary yeah. things. Yeah, it was but in there. It, it was an enormous... <laughs> was an enormous project. There were 100,000 people employed at the height. And by the way, it was so secret that um, when FDR died and Truman became president, the Secretary of War, the very same day, uh, told him, President Truman, there's something I want to tell you. <laughs> he didn't know that the, um, the atom bomb had been developed. I'm Unbelievable. Gonna, I'm going to ask uh, if, if the two of you want to read a passage from the book, your favorite passage. Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I just happen to be ready. Yeah, sure. Um, and guess what I'm going to read? I'm going to read, I had mentioned to you that a very exciting part of this book was, for me anyway, the, um, the whole scene uh, beneath the football field. Um, so this is a scene where the, um, the experiment is successful, and people were not cheering. They, they knew the import of this. Uh, people were very happy that the experiment had gone well. They were happy that they didn't all get blown up, uh, but they, they understood also the implications of this. Um, so they... It was in the evening by the time they left, but one of the things that the head of the Chicago ex experiment, Compton, had to do was to let the people in Washington know how this experiment went. And that call was going to be put to James Conant, who was president of Harvard, but also led the major committee in Washington that was responsible for coming up with an answer about what to do with the with the bomb. So Compton calls um, James Conant in Washington. And as was indicated, this was a very secret effort uh, that Hutchins didn't even know about it. Uh, so they had to, over the phone, disguise things a bit. So they talked a little bit in disguise here. So this, this is Compton talking to Conant, and he says, Jim, You'll be interested to know that the Italian navigator, who could that be, has just landed in the New World. Conan's excited response was, is that so? Were the natives friendly? <laughs> I answered, everyone landed safe and happiness, safe and happy. As dark, that's the end of that conversation, as darkness began to descend on Chicago that December afternoon, those in the squash court drifted slowly out. Zinn, who had been the first to greet Fermi at the pile in the morning, was the last physicist to leave in the evening. When he finally filed out, one of the guards stationed outside asked him, what's going on, doctor? Something happened in there? Something had indeed happened. None of those in the squash court that afternoon forgot being there when the pile went critical. It had only generated a maximum power of half a watt, scarcely enough to light a flashlight battery. However, if that rate had been allowed to grow unchecked, it would have killed everyone in the squash court and wrecked havoc in the city of Chicago. So. So, um... I'll read something from the um, the very beginning of the book. It's the in the in the prologue. I know where it is. That we can let that uh, flop <laughs> there. Um, when the bomb, they wasn't they weren't sure the the 
plutonium bomb would work. So there was a test at Trinity. Um, and there was a lot of discussion. They had a betting pool. Is it going to work or not? Um, and how big of a bomb will it be? So they're all lying in the desert there on July 16th in the New Mexico desert. And they're looking at, from a distance, at the site where the bomb is due to explode. Um, and it finally went up, the famous now mushroom cloud. Uh, and the reactions were varied. Uh, my uncle, I have, a, I have an uncle who's a physicist, and in fact was Fermi's first student in Rome in the old days, and they worked together a lot. And then this uncle was at Los Alamos, and in fact was at Los Alamos, was at Fermi's side when the bomb went off. And his impression, he always tried to imitate Fermi, but couldn't quite get there. He wasn't quite as rational. And when he saw it, he remembers thinking, oh my God, we've set the world on fire. And then he said, no, 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 that's impossible. That's impossible, Fermi did, you know. But the reactions were, um, some of them are on record. Oppenheimer remembered the lines, and this is now from the book, Oppenheimer remembered the lines from the Bhagavad Gita scriptures coming to him. I am becoming death the destroyer of worlds. Bainbridge, another physicist there, expressed himself in much more prosaic language, saying to Oppenheimer, now we're all sons of bitches. Um, meanwhile, I'll go on just a little bit more. What was Fermi doing? And this is now reading from uh, the book. Um, as the blast went off, a few seconds after the blast, Fermi stood up and began tearing a large piece of paper into small pieces and then dropping them from his upraised hand. Forty seconds later, as the front of the shock wave hit, the midair pieces were blown a short distance away. Pacing the distance to where they landed some feet away, he, consult he consulted a little chart he had prepared, prepared beforehand. Shortly afterwards, Fermi told those around them that he estimated the blast force as roughly equivalent to 10 tons of TNT. Uh, he was right, by the way. <laughs> Not on exactly, but he treated it as another experiment. He did. Amazing. All right, we're going to draw this part to a close so that we can have you ask some questions, but please join me in thanking Gina and the team. Thank you. What happened to the pile at the University of Chicago after the experiment? Um, they, Is it still there? <laughs> no. They took, they took it apart and they rebuilt it where they originally wanted to have it in the Argonne Forest. So the pile was known as CP1. CP2 was um, assembled in the, uh, and um, increased in the um, Argonne Forest site. There are still, uh, we just got an email from a friend of ours at the University of Chicago saying he thinks he may have discovered one of the original bricks and he wants to have it tested. And the bricks weigh 20 pounds. These, these are big bricks, so graphite big bricks. Uh, so they, they are not insignificant in size. And, and when the a uh, construction company basically thinked out on the job and the physicists started building it. They got the help, incidentally, of some very strong kids in Chicago that were from the neighborhood of the backyards. Um, these were basically immigrant kids who helped them uh, haul the bricks. And it, this was a high thing. This was 20, 25 feet high, and it, it, was, it was big. So, um, and, it, and it was unheated and freezing, December yeah. in Chicago. <clears throat> so, Gino, you've written three books before this, and this was the first time that the two of you collaborated. How did you deal with who was going to write what? <laughs> I got to write the sexy parts. Now, uh, <laughs> um, I think I think. Well, you were asking Gino. Why don't you talk about it? I, then I'll give you my perspective. Well, the um, drafts went back and forth. Sometimes, if it was 
If it was primarily physics, I would probably write the first draft. If it was primarily um, politics, Bettina would probably write the first draft. But they all went back and forth between us, so um, that's the way it was. At least that's the way I remember it. It's accurate. <laughs> yes. How did the U.S. Uh, choose an uh, Italian fascist to head up this project? I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. How did I what? How did the United States choose an Italian fascist to head up their uh, Manhattan project? Uh, uh, well, uh, there are a couple of ways to answer that. The FBI investigated him and said, um, he's a fascist, don't trust him. He should not be cleared for government work. Um, a professor at Chicago who was on the project told the head of the project then, who was Arthur Compton, said, hey, if you want to talk to somebody about how to do this, the man to talk to is Fermi. And um, he was cleared. Yeah, I think it might be a little unfair to characterize him as a, an Italian fascist. Uh, he belonged to the Italian to the fascist party. So yes, technically, when he went, he escaped Italy um, essentially via Stockholm. He uh, is a classy escape. He picked up his Nobel Prize on the way to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that's the way they had they had very, very carefully strategized that, that that would be how they would get out of Italy. Uh, when he got the Nobel Prize, he did not give the fascist salute, nor did he uh, dress in the uniform of the, of the Academy, of the Royal Academy. Um, he was not identifying as a fascist, and the newspapers in Italy were all over him. The, the story there was not that he won a Nobel. The story was that he had been disrespectful to Italy. Uh, they did not regard him as a fascist. When he came to this country, he was not regarded as a fascist. He was regarded as an eminent physicist who could get things done and who had been introduced to the United States when he landed with his family in New York on January 2nd, 1939, um, he turned to them beaming and said, we have just established the American branch of the Fermi fam family. Uh, so I think he didn't identify that way and he was not identified that way even though the army at one point thought him a risk. Here he was working on the most secret project. He had a bodyguard, um, he, uh, he had a name, that, this was when he was at Los Alamos, Henry Farmer was his name, uh, that was the name he traveled by, uh, but he was considered a loyal American. And let me just add a footnote to that, uh, the Italian university system is a state system, so the universities, essentially all of them are state universities, and in 1931, uh, all professors were asked to um, swear their loyalty to Mussolini and basically to join the fascist party. Of the 1,200 professors at the time, only 12 refused, and those were, um, all 12 were either emigrating then or were reaching retirement. So, um, and, and they felt, hey, if we don't do this, then we will be replaced by people who are really fascists. So we should, uh, this is something we should do. So, you know, fascism in Italy is, uh, of course, was a terrible thing, but it, it, it's, it's not quite the same, I think, as Nazism was in Germany. It's not, it isn't, it wasn't that terrible as Nazism. Well, let's maybe not talk about bad and terrible. I think it's odd that we're talking about fascism in 2016. I can't imagine why. Um, but I, I do wonder at sort of 
a love of physics and, equa and, and that yielding a passivity about the world, uh, both in, in terms of his joining the party, but, but more in terms of him um, building a machine that you can't possibly use and then saying, let's use it against uh, an enemy uh, whose air force we had already destroyed and could bomb at will um, conventionally uh, because he never thought about what it meant to have an atomic weapon. Or if he did, it wasn't as much fun as the experiment. And I'm wondering about that, that passivity sort of a, in a Gingrichian way. Well, passivity, let's also, I, I'm going to let you answer this. <laughs> My, uh, <laughs> but I will say that this is the recommendation made by uh, the, um, the scientific panel of the interim committee, which was, um, had other than Fermi, had the three most distinguished physicists who were involved on the Manhattan Project, namely, Compton, Lawrence, and Oppenheimer. So, um, Bettina, <laughs> take it away. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I think we alluded to the fact that this was something that bothered us, uh, you know, throughout the book in terms of just our own stance. And I think part of the challenge for this book, and in terms of me, was trying to look at this person for who he was and not through my lens always. Um, and it's very tempting for all of us to look at the world through our own lens, uh, which means that of course you have to speak out, of course you, and I doesn't apply at all to today, but, uh, <laughs> but of course you have to speak out. And here was somebody who was just in a priesthood, kind of, 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 of physics, uh, who, who didn't feel that way. But I think it's hard to make a judgment about this in terms of what if this had been arrived at by a country, another country, would they have used it? Would Lon London have uh, been a victim of the atomic bomb uh, if, if Germany had gotten there first? Uh, so, so there are those questions. It's a, it's a complicated answer. I, I don't have an answer, actually. It's so complicated. Uh, but it, it's one that plagues us today in terms of the threat of nuclear war and how do we handle that. Uh, the people in that era had almost two months to discuss this. Um, from what I can understand, anyway, if there is an atomic bomb headed our way through a missile or something. We have about, I thought it was 10 minutes, but the other day, I think Elizabeth Warren said four minutes to, to make a decision. Uh, these decisions are not easy. We don't have a mechanism in place to make them today. And um, I would add to that, that at the time, uh, you said the, the Air Force, the Japanese Air Force was destroyed, but it was believed that there would uh, have to be a land invasion of Japan and that there would be um, losses, large losses involved in that because there was a group of the Japanese armed forces that would fight to the very end. So that was also in that mix of the decision. Given the secrecy and the number of people who worked on this and the number of government people who mm -hmm. had to know something. What do you know about how the discussion went? Did any of those thousand people say no or leave? Okay. Um, well, I think there are kind of two questions there in terms of how it was a very secret project and how, how did they keep that so secret. And it, it is amazing to think about because it was academia, government, industry. They were all in secret about this. 100,000 people uh, were working on it, and yet it was a secret project. 
So were there discussions? Yes, there were discussions. There were discussions at Los Alamos, uh, again, prior to even uh, the test at uh, Trinity being successful. Uh, there was uh, a, a, a scientist at Los Alamos, physicist Robert Wilson, who insisted to Fermi that to, uh, I'm sorry, to Oppenheimer, uh, that there be lab-wide discussions about this so that people could air their opinions. The decision-making as such were those four scientists. Um, and they knew about the discussions, they knew about the controversies, and they made their judgment. For better or for worse, they made their judgment. Uh, but it, it was widely discussed within the labs, if um, that makes sense. Externally, people didn't know about it. Laura Fermi had no, we haven't even mentioned her, and she's quite an, an amazing woman. She didn't know um, what, what had happened when Fermi came back from the test in um, the Trinity test. Uh, she knew that he had not driven home that night. Um, and whether that was he was exhausted or he was emotionally spent, uh, we don't know, but it was rare for him not to be at the driver's wheel. And she, but she had no idea what had happened. Uh, and uh, other, and they were mainly wives at Los Alamos, had no idea either. And after it was dropped, you know, Los Alamos, I think there was initially great jubilation that the war was won. And then, then the horrors of it uh, became known and sank in, and there were moral questions that were asked and were debated. The Los Alamos scientists formed a group called the Association of Los Alamos Scientists, which the acronym for that, and if you can't do that quickly, is called ALAS. Um, and these were people who were saying, we, we have to figure out what to do about the, the bomb in the future. And Fermi did not join that group. And um, <clears throat> I would ask, I mean, I would add to that, you, you did, I believe, also ask if anybody left the project. And um, as far as we know, there was only one person who left, a man named a Polish physicist who had uh, emigrated to England and came over as part of the English mission, a man named Joseph Rotblat. And he left at the end of 1944, when it was beginning to become clear that the Germans did not have the capacity to build the weapon. Um, he was a, a, a distinguished physicist, but not one of the major figures at Los Alamos. He later became a peace activist. Had Fermi's wife not been Jewish? You have to. Had Fermi's wife not been Jewish? Do you think there's a possibility he wouldn't have come to the United States? Um, no. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he would have come. Uh, this, is, this is where the science was happening, among other things, uh, that the leading scientists from Germany who were Jewish had come here. The scientists from Italy had come here. Uh, people were coming here, and this this was where it was where it was happening and exciting. And he really liked the country, so I, I don't see that he would have uh, stayed in Italy. Um, I, I think that as much as we have emphasized that he was apolitical, uh, I think there would have even been a limit for Fermi. As you as you know, perhaps from going to South Philadelphia, Italians have strong families. <laughs> and um, I think if Laura had not been uh, so attached to her family, um, Fermi would have come earlier. His parents had died in, in the 20s, um, and physics was, as Bettina said, his priesthood. And I think he would have come earlier um, if she had not been Jewish, uh, would he have left Italy? Now there's the question. His good friend uh, Amaldi in his work 
and co-worker did not leave Italy for much the same reason. So uh, as much as he wanted to come to the United States, if Laura had not been Jewish, there is then a chance that he would not have come to the United States. The atom bomb would not have been developed in World War II in time for the end of the war. This is a story full of what ifs. Mm -hmm. You know, if Fermi had discovered fission in 1935, which was a clear possibility, then perhaps the Germans would have taken a crash program to develop the bomb, uh, which the other countries would not have done. And um, the world would have been different that way. But as we know, life is full of what ifs. In this case, the what ifs were big stakes. I think the answer, and obviously Gino and I disagree on this a bit, but I do think the answer is that he was an extraordinarily complicated man uh, in his simplicity in some way. And uh, that was a hard thing for us to grasp. It was a hard thing to convey in the book. But I hope that we did it in a way that you can make your own judgments about it. All right, thank you.